Chapter 8, The Self-Milking Cow and the Light Behind the Door. As if to encourage Roy in his daring undertaking, the very morning he was he had planned for the search, a thrilling story was brought to him. Old Sandy the fisherman, whose oar was returned so strangely, had come home from a night's fishing to tell how he had seen something move in front of the cave as he was putting out to sea the evening before. He wasn't near enough to see what it was, but that someone or something strange was there. He was perfectly sure. Then on top of this, Roy learned that old Peter MacDonald returned home past the cave late last night, had again heard peculiar noises issuing from it. Naturally, the stories were discredited by most of the villagers who recalled the vain search already made. But for Roy, they were of the deepest interest. He felt more eager than ever to go on his great expedition and could hardly wait to start. Yet it was risky. Suppose the mysteries should not be connected in the occupants of the cave should prove to be smugglers or spies. The thought of that nearly made him draw back. Was it really worth the risk? For a moment, he was tempted to give up his idea. Then he remembered the old saying, nothing ventured, nothing win. And he summed up his courage and resolved to go. Roy planned to start out directly after lunch, hoping to get the whole business finished before supper but he was considerably delayed by the arrival at the store of one of the villagers who, greatly excited, began to pour out the most curious story. Oh, Mr. Wallace, began the old lady, I've never saw the likes of it in all my days. I never did. My old cow, sir, milked herself. Well, sir, I don't mean exactly that, but it seemed like it. You know how bad I've been feeling all late. Sometimes, Mr. Wallace, I've hardly been able to get up at all. But I've always remembered old Nancy and tried to milk her regularly. Then, Mr. Wallace, yesterday morn, when I was feeling about as bad as ever I have felt of late, I felt I couldn't get up, but made myself at last. When I went to the door, what should I find but my two milk cans full to the brim and a note beside them, saying, Don't worry about Nancy this morning. The old villager paused for breath, then hurried on. That wasn't all, Mr. Wallace. This morning the same thing happened. It's beyond me, sir, as the neighbors know nothing about it. It can't be devils, sir. It can't, for devils wouldn't do a kind thing like that. It must be angels, sir, or, or sir, unless it's ghosts. Have you the note that was put beside the milk? Asked Roy with interest. That's the stupid thing I did. I meant to keep it, but then, like the foolish old woman I am, I put it on the fire with some waste paper. Roy would have liked to investigate this latest event more carefully, but he was now seeking bigger game, and decided to leave the self-milking Nancy till a later time. Should his afternoon errand prove futile, he could but follow up this other trail. Having heard all he thought the old lady could tell him, he left her to continue the discussion of the affair with the others and started out on his expedition. Four o'clock found him at the entrance of the cave, standing on the bottom of the rough-hewn steps, looking up at the black hole he was to enter. Now it is much easier to plan to enter an unknown and perhaps inhabited cavern than it is to walk in when you get there. At least Roy found it so. His legs weren't quite as steady as they had been a few minutes before. 
But reason finally overcame fear, at least to a large degree. He had come to explore the cave, not to stand looking at it. And in he would go. He climbed the steps, stood in the entrance, and listened. There was no sound, save the quiet dashing of the waves on the rocky shore below. Roy turned on the light, and its brilliant beam shone far into the interior. But it revealed nothing save rocky walls and a fork in the passage some distance inside. For a moment he had an almost uncontrollable desire to turn and run. But controlling himself with a great effort of will, he strode in. A few steps brought him to the forked passage. Looking on the chart he had made from the reports of the villagers, he found the division marked. After a moment's thought, he decided to take the road to the right. Slowly he walked on, flashing his powerful light around him so that he might carefully examine the walls for any trace of recent occupation. Meanwhile, he hummed a tune softly to himself to help keep up his courage. The passage which rose gradually brought him into a fair-sized room, and there he stopped. Having examined this thoroughly, he re retraced his steps, then turned along another passage, which he had passed on his way up. This, too, proved to be a blind alley, so he returned to the main fork and took the left-hand corridor. This turned to be a far more intricate winding in many directions and branching at several places. In many cases, his chart did not tally with what he found, and he wondered many times whether or not he should go on or go back. Nevertheless, he was determined to do the job thoroughly while he was about it, and made up his mind to look everywhere. He had nearly finished now and was looking forward to the glad moment when the nerve strain would end and he would live again in pure air and brighter light. At last he came to the place described by the fisher folk as the landslide. Truly it looked like one. The passage at this point was quite different from its usual shape and pieces of granite, large and small, were strewn about the floor. Roy flashed his light hither and thither, looking carefully at everything around him. This section of the passage certainly was unlike anything he had yet seen. One part of the wall was particularly flat, so unlike the rest, it looked like rock. Yet, Roy looked closer. What was that? He brought his light right down upon it. It was a piece of string. He went to pick it up, but found it would not move. One end was fixed within the wall. He pulled hard. There was a click. Then, to his amazement, part of the wall moved and a small door opened, revealing another and evidently secret passage. The door was, heavy, was of heavy oak, painted to look like rock. It was a moment or two before he could steady himself after this shock. Then, having made sure the door could not close behind him, he followed the beam of his flashlight into the blackness. This tunnel was much smaller than the others in which he had been. Sometimes his head almost touched the roof. Occasionally the sides came so near that there was hardly room for him to walk in comfort. The length of the passage amazed him, and the farther he went, the greater grew his desire to turn back and go. He had gone, he thought, perhaps a half a mile, and was about to give up and return, when distant noises brought him to a standstill, petrified with fright. However, as they became no louder, he decided to go cautiously ahead and see whence they proceeded, to avoid exposing himself 
He turned off his flashlight and fumbled along as best he could in the darkness. The noises became more distinct, though still muffled by distance. Roy hastened on as fast as he dared. Suddenly, as he turned round a bend in the passage, he found himself confronting an old doorway, through chinks and cracks of which light was shining. Trembling from head to foot, but buoyed up with the thought that triumph was near at hand, he noiselessly crept toward the door, put his eye to the largest opening, and looked in.